Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Shital Chaudhuri will defend the academic thesis, Application of Digital Technology and Artificial Intelligence in Nephrology. May I invite you to, get, to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. Highly esteemed prorector, highly esteemed members of the Corona, dear guests, family and friends, it's with great pleasure I present my thesis titled Application of Digital Technology in Artificial Intelligence in Nephrology. Here's a brief agenda for the presentation. We will begin by looking at the background. Then we will look into a few examples from my thesis, AI implementation in clinical practice, digital technology application, AI application during the COVID-19 pandemic, prognostic utility of AI application using a large global database, and then we will conclude with some limitations and benefits. So as a brief background, chronic kidney disease is a growing global burden. We have over 800 million patients worldwide. It's very common in people who have diabetes and hypertension, people who are of racial minorities, elderly, and those who are women. It's a growing cause of concern in many low and middle income countries. And it's estimated to be the fifth leading cause of death by 2040. When patients have chronic kidney disease, they often transition onto end stage kidney disease. And at this, in this stage, the kidneys are unable to remove excess fluids and toxins from the body. The ideal option for the patient is to get a transplant. However, that's often very challenging in many countries. The alternative then is to be on dialysis, where a machine takes over the role of a kidney. Inpatient hemodialysis is a common form of dialysis patients perform in a clinic or a hospital setting. Home hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis is a common form of dialysis patients perform at home. We all know the cost of healthcare is increasing due to inflation and other rising costs. This is the data from the United States. However, this is common across all the other regions of the world as well. We spend about 100 billion Medicare dollars on kidney care each year. One in five Medicare dollars is only spent on dialysis and this is only increasing. So why is all of this important and how can digital technologies and artificial intelligence help? So before we answer that, let's define what we mean by these terminologies. Digital technologies are anything from telemedicine, where a patient can talk to their doctor through a mobile phone or a computer application, email messaging, text messaging, wearable devices like Apple Watch or Fitbit that a lot of patients wear, and other clinic and remote monitoring sensors. All of this collects data. And it's become more prominent now post pandemic where more and more patients are talking to their doctors virtually. And what is artificial intelligence or machine learning? AI is a program that enables computers to mimic human behavior. Machine learning is a subset of AI that uses statistical methods to build these programs. Deep learning is a further subset of machine learning. However, deep learning is out of scope of my discussion in the thesis today. And we are surrounded by AI all the time, be it Netflix recommending a movie to watch on a Friday night or Amazon suggesting products we should be buying together, self-driving cars, chat GPT, I think you've heard about this in media all the time, and voice recognition tools such as Alexa or Google Home that everybody has at home. What if we could use some of these technologies in healthcare and more so in caring for dialysis patients? For dialysis patients, if we could use data from the electronic medical record system, the machine data itself, or wearable devices, maybe we could feed it into a sophisticated algorithm and create applications for prognosis or prediction, for identifying patterns in the data, making treatment recommendations or medication recommendations. I mean, these are just a few examples. And we will look at a few of these examples in my thesis. 
AI implementation in clinical practice. AI implementation in clinical practice is more common in the fields of maybe ophthalmology or radiology uh, and other fields of healthcare, not so much in the field of nephrology. When we conducted this particular study, there was only one paper that described positive clinical outcome for using, of using machine learning model in a clinical setting. In this, we looked at a machine learning model that was developed to predict risk of in-center hemodialysis patients of having at least six hospital admissions in the following 12 months. The model used data from the electronic medical record system, such as treatment history, lab values, lifestyle data, quality of life data, comorbidity data, demographic data, and so on. We had approximately 300 different input variables that went into the model. The results of the model were used by an interdisciplinary group of social workers, nurses, and dietitians who reviewed these high-risk patients every month and provided focused clinical intervention, especially around behavioral health intervention. And what we observed here was that the group of clinics that used the machine learning model and the thoughtful interventions that were designed had 10% lower hospital admission rate an 8% lower hospital days rate compared to a control group of clinics in the three years after the start of the pilot. The reason this study is important is because this shows it's not just the machine learning model, but it's a combination of the model along with the thoughtful interventions that is likely to have made the positive outcome. The next example of, of a digital technology application in this, we look at a group of peritoneal dialysis patients dialyzing at home and reporting um, treatment-related parameters using a remote treatment monitoring application called Patient Hub. They would report treatment-related issues or and other clinical parameters uh, using this application. And if there were any red flags, they were reviewed by a remote group of clinicians and appropriate intervention was provided. What we observed here was that the frequent users of the remote treatment monitoring application had 22% lower hospital admission rate and 38% lower hospital days rate compared to non-users of the application, and it continued to decrease. 30% of the frequent users also had lower risk of PD failure compared to the non-users. The reason this study is important is because when patients are more proactive and engaged in taking care of themselves using such remote treatment monitoring applications, and those who are engaged with their clinicians are likely to have better clinical outcomes. The next application is an AI application during the COVID-19 pandemic. Early on in the pandemic, we observed that in-center hemodialysis patients had subtle trends in their clinical and laboratory parameters in the days leading up to them testing positive. We used some of those learnings to develop a machine learning prediction model to predict hemodialysis patients of having a SARS-CoV-2 infection within the following three days. The top three predictors of the model were changes in intradialytic weight gain from the previous month, alluding to the fact that they may have had a loss in appetite, pre-HD body temperature from the prior week, and changes in post-HD heart rate. The changes were subtle, so the machine learning model was able to identify combinations of these factors that are clinically independently not remarkable. The reason the study is important is because if we can proactively identify patients of having an adverse event in a pandemic-like situation, we may be able to isolate them in time and thus curb the spread of the disease. So for all the applications you've seen, use data from the North American dialysis patients. In this last example, we will look at an application that was developed using a large global database of geographically distributed hemodialysis patients. Monitoring dialysis outcome, or the Mondo database, has data from five different continents, 11 regions, 37 countries, nine providers, and this particular study had used data from 95,000 dialysis patients spread across the globe. 
We developed a machine learning model to predict the risk of death in the following three years. The top three predictors of the advanced ML model was higher age, which was not a surprise, lower albumin, and lower hematocrit, which was an interesting finding. The reason this study is important is because we use data from several different electronic medical record system, which was collected in a standardized format. And we also, in the study, compared the risk factors from the advanced ML model to more traditional metrics, such as odds ratio estimate, that's generally well understood in the clinical community. With that, I would like to move on to this very important slide on AI limitations. And I think this is really important because we hear so much about ChatGPT GPT and other large language models these days. All AI applications should be ethical and explainable. It should be inclusive, should not be biased towards any certain group of individuals. It should be fair. It should be transparent. We should know where the data is coming from. It should be secured. It should follow all the rules and regulations of the country where it's been implemented in. It should be reliable and safe. And there has to be accountability when you implement such models in clinical practice. In conclusion, we will look at the benefits and some concerns from three different perspectives. From a dialysis patient's perspective, it can clearly help improve quality of life. It can reduce the risk of adverse events. It can help them be engaged with their clinicians. However, there are concerns around data and confidentiality and security, that there is no bias in care, and that the patients are able to use the technology. From a dialysis provider's perspective, it can provide proactive and personalized care, clearly lower overall cost of care if used correctly. But there are concerns around that it does not alter healthcare policies like insurance charging higher premium because the patient is high risk all of a sudden, and that it is operationalized and piloted thoughtfully. From a nephrologist's perspective, it can help identify patterns in the data, reduce the time it takes to care for patients, and reduce burnout. Ultimately, it's a clinical decision support tool. But there are concerns around data and decision transparency, does not replace their clinical judgment, and it does not hinder the communication between the nephrologist and the patient. With that, I would like to conclude with this very important picture that's on the cover of my thesis. And I think this is an important message I want to conclude this presentation with. AI and digital technologies cannot operate by itself. It has to work hand in hand with the clinical judgment of a nephrologist. Thank you for your attention. And I would like to pass the word back on to the prorector. Thank you very much for this very clear uh, explanation of a rather complicated topic. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge that we have some guests from Ukraine in the audience, so welcome. And then we will start with the um, defense of the thesis. Um, and the defense will be opened by Professor Bone, Professor of Rheumatology at the Maastricht University, and she was member of the assessment committee. Professor Bone. Thank you. Dear candidate, before starting our discussion, I would like to congratulate you with uh, this beautiful thesis on the fourth revolution in production technology. Thank you. And as you emphasized, it is important that you um, used applications for AI for clinical relevant questions. And that's what right. I really like. And I also congratulate your team that uh, supports this kind of research. I would like to discuss with you some facts from uh, chapter three. And uh, first, a clarification. If I look at your beautiful table on the different AI technologies, then I understand that in chapter three, the tool that you use uh, for the uh, dialysis hospitalization reduction program is a supervised classification model using decision, traced, uh, decision um, tr and tree-based methods. Uh, and what I would like you to do is very briefly explain or justify why among all these models you have chosen this method? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. So that's true, a lot of, our, a lot, lot of my 
uh, models presented in this thesis uses the decision tree based model and most more so specifically the XG boost algorithm. It is a very powerful algorithm. It is able to handle missing data clearly. I mean, there is no need for imputation in, these, uh, in this particular model. And I think that's one of the main reasons of, for using the XGBoost algorithm. And you know, it, it learns, it's a, it's, a, it's a gradient boosting algorithm. It's an extreme gradient boosting algorithm. It learns from its... Uh, so uh, for clinical practice where you have lots of missings, this is something yes. you would recommend? Yes, Thank you. that's correct. But let's uh, start some other uh, aspects of, the, of chapter three, which pertain a little bit to the causal relation between the introduction of the AI, AI tool and intervention and uh, uh, results on the hospitalization rate. And when I look at uh, page 55, I understand that um, you match the centers that you compare in 2015, and then you have the intervention between 2016 and 2018, yes. and then you conclude on the reduction, the 10% reduction, not since the start of the intervention, but since the start of 2015, the matching. So I wonder actually what what is the reason of the um, decrease in hospitalization rate, because between 2016 and 2018, it's negligible. You have already a difference in hospitalization rate in 2015 of minus 0 0.12, which is minus 0 0.15 uh, in uh, 2018. So what what is now the effect of the pilot? So what we're concluding here is that the difference between the control group and the pilot group in 2015 was minimal, mm -hmm. but the difference is more mm -hmm. in 2018, after the start of the pilot. So it kept on, the difference between the groups kept increasing year over year, is what the conclusion is. But would you agree that the main change occurred between 2015 and 2016? Yes, because okay. the pilot started at the beginning of 2016. So we would expect some, you know, if the... It already includes the, the data, the, it already includes yes, results. Yes, yes, oh, yes. Okay, yes. I thought it was a, a baseline yes. of uh, 2016. Yes. But then, still, so you have that intervention and you use the AI tool. So I wonder... Uh, and you did the propensity score matching. Yes, yes. And what I wonder is whether the, um, how you developed the propensity score, what was your outcome? Was what was the outcome of the propensity score? Yeah. To, to calculate the propensity score. So I have a table that shows the... And the outcome of the regression, I mean, was that hospitalizations, was that, what was the outcome of your regression? Yes, so table 3.1 and table, table 3.1 specifically shows the mean standard difference mm -hmm. between the control and the pilot clinic. Yes, and then you do... So it was a very well-matched cohort. And, and for the weights of the propensity score, you do a regression, and the outcome is hospitalizations, or what was your outcome? Yes, so we did an exact match on the hospital admission rate. Exactly, and that's why where my question raises, because I wonder actually whether you, I thought this, but uh -huh. I think that your uh, propensity score matching, shouldn't that have been on the likelihood that the center, and uh, the, the, the center started with the tool, with the AI tool, because now you have many patient-related factors, right. but it might be that the centers that adopted the uh -huh. that they were already, you know, giving very good care and were already having advanced techniques to pick up uh, early uh, signals. And so there might be hospital aspects uh -huh. that also could contribute to the changes that you see over time. Could you agree with that? Yeah, I agree. Yes. Okay. Well, so that's nice to agree. And then um, you, you did a much effort to understand whether the main uh, main 
benefits came from the social and psychological yes. interventions or from the medical interventions. That's correct. And I understand completely real li life data. It's very difficult to s understand what all those doctors and nurses do. Right. But um, could you have looked at the reasons for hospitalization? Were, was there a difference in the reasons for the rehospitalizations? Mm. Yeah, so we have not looked at that difference in, no. Uh, yeah, no, uh, that's a limitation again. But. But uh, even from the interventions perspective, we were able to measure the social worker intervention. But there were other clinical interventions that were happening on these patients, like the dietitian was also involved. Mm -hmm. And there were other nurses, but we had a limitation on capturing some of those limitations and measuring those, uh, the interventions that were okay. happening. Yeah, so that w that's definitely a limitation. You think there. that these are the most the factors that changed most and uh, likely have a yeah. relevant effect. And that was measurable at that at this point, yeah. Um, and then I still have a technical question on the area under the curve calculation. And um, what, I, what I wonder is how machine learning defines the thresholds that make that you classify a patient as high risk. And in clinical practice, when we do it manually, um, usually you can choose a method and you balance between sensitivity or specificity with exactly. the Leo or the Uden, yeah. or you'd say, I prefer a bit more sensitivity or yes. a bit more specificity. But how, how does artificial intelligence do that? It's the same thing. I think we've set the threshold by looking okay. at the sensitivity and specificity. That has, that's there is no change in that methodology. That's what you do. You choose the, yes. the thresholds. Okay. Yes. Yes. And have you been able to check the sensitivity and specificity or positive and negative predictive value of the tool? Yes, we do. I think for this particular, um, we don't have it reported, but we were able to. We do have the... Uh, the recall was 0 0.70. The AUC was 0.89. Okay. And we have the F1 score, which was 0.29, uh, I believe, yes. Okay. Yeah, F1 score of 0.38. Which is, which is quite good, sufficiently sensitive to uh, pick up everyone and not yes. over. Yes, um, yes, yes. And that was, this was one of the first uh, pilots of our machine learning model. So it was more around making sure that the clinical community understood these concepts yes. more, so, yeah. I'm looking at the chair, whether I can, is it fine? Yeah, I am very happy with the answers, so thank I you can very go much. back to the fact of. So thank you very much, Professor Borner. We make a change in time zone. We go over to the United States. Good morning there. Uh, the next uh, opposition is performed by Professor Fires from the United States. She is professor of pediatrics at the University of North Cal Carolina, Keppel, Chapel Hill in the United States, and she was also a member of the assessment committee, Professor Ferris. Oh, I cannot hear. No sound. Can you hear us? We don't, we don't hear you. So what we will do, we'll change to the next opponent and then come back. Is that an idea? Yes. Okay, so sorry for that, but we will have to change to the next opponent, also online. Let's hope that the, and we come back to Professor Ferenc, of course. Uh, the next opponent is Professor Van Biesen. He is um, Professor of Internal Medicine and at the University of Ghent, Belgium and he was also a member of the assessment committee. Professor Van Biesen. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to be present of this panel. Uh, first of all, my congratulations also to the candidate uh, for bringing on a very nice uh, work on a very important topic and which is growing in relevance, I think. Um, and it's very enlightening to see that she's trying to bring very basic concepts about artificial intelligence, digitalization uh, of medicine uh, in a very understandable format. Uh, and that's probably one of the major achievements uh, of what's being done uh, in this work and trying to find out or to, to demonstrate clinical applicability uh, of what we are doing. Uh, my first question is a kind of uh, progression of the, the questions of the, the previous um, uh, jury member uh, about chapter three. Um, if I understand well, what you did in the study is that 
um, centers were randomized to have the tool or do, to not have the tool. Um, and then in the centers where the tool was used, the tool tried to indicate high risk people and the high risk people get more involvement of social workers and the additions, et cetera, et cetera. But to my understanding, and I searched very much for that in the control group, nothing happened. So how can you be sure that the difference was really made by the artificial intelligence tool and not by the work of the social workers. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. So I think the conclusion, I mean, what we're trying to say in this particular uh, study, first of all, it's more of a retrospective study. It's not a randomized control trial. This was done as a retrospective analysis. We, you know, we looked at it uh, in the, we compared, we found a control group of clinics that matched on certain factors. Um, and we, what we are concluding here is it's a combination of the machine learning model and the social worker intervention. I think that's an important message. I do not think machine learning models can make a difference by itself if there is no clinical intervention. The social worker intervention was a very critical part of this uh, pilot program. Uh, and social worker intervention was the only one that was measured, but there were other interventions that happened, like the clinical intervention from the dietitians or the nurses that were using the model. So it's really a combination of the, mo of the model and the interventions from this interdisciplinary group that resulted in the positive outcome. Uh, I think that's my, uh, that's what I would uh, try to uh, stress here on in this study, because AI and machine learning cannot, I mean, that goes back to the cover of my thesis, it cannot operate by itself. It has to work hand in hand with the clinical judgment. And I think that's an important message I would like to stress on. You would be a policymaker, a financer of, of healthcare. How would you make certain that investing money in AI to do what you did in this pilot study is worth the money? How would you design such a study? Agree. That's a great question, highly esteemed opponent. Um, I think when you design these interventions, you have to understand what the cost of intervention is. And that also goes back to, you know, how many patients can we intervene on? Goes back to the recall and the precision. How many resources you have? I think that's really important. You have to know how many patients can you, can you actually intervene on? What is the cost of that intervention? I think that is a study that needs to happen whenever there is a clinical implementation. Uh, I think that cost-benefit analysis is extremely important. Um, there are, from a benefit standpoint, there, could, there, is, there is monetary benefit and then there is also clinical benefit for the patient. I guess we got to take the, both the benefits into consideration when you do the cost-benefit analysis. Uh, but that's a study that you need to take on before we implement any clinical implementation and clinical AI implementation and clinical practice. Okay, that's a very sensible answer. Uh, a bit cautious, I think, but okay. Um, now let's shift a bit to the philosophical aspects of AI and digital medicine. Um, and in your points, propositions of the thesis, point nine, uh, you state that traditional statistical approaches and advanced AI have both their strengths and weaknesses, um, and the, the, their use depends upon the specific goals. Can you explain briefly what the difference between these two is and how that impacts on what we can learn as a scientific community from these both models? What are they using as their background idea on how we can learn in the scientific world? Absolutely. I would like to draw your attention towards table 2.1 of my thesis, where I have differentiated between the two different uh, methodologies. I think traditional statistical methods work very well with smaller data sets. Advanced ML techniques work 
good with large data sets and maybe more so with voice and you know image recognition and other things. Um, you can use for usability purposes. Um, traditional models are more like an exploratory and you, you can use it to build smaller models, but when you want to do more uh, large scale rollout, I think advanced ML techniques are better, but it depends from situation to situation. Every situation is different. Uh, I think that's uh, important to state. Uh, as I mentioned, your types of input data works very well with categorical and numerical, you know, works with other data types, including audio, image, and free text. And there are some examples of what these different techniques are. Um, I think it depends from case to case, I guess. Uh, every situation is different, so you have to, both of them have their strengths and weaknesses. Um, but I think um, you have to look at the use case and make the appropriate decision. That's what you should always do. Can I refer you to page 12 of your thesis? And in the upper paragraph, um, you say that um, AI algorithms try to learn from the data without concrete rules. So does that answer my previous question or how, what do you mean by that sentence? Is it uh, page 12? Is that the one you are referring to? Can you please point me to the page, paragraph? Page 12 of the introduction, chapter one. Yes, that's correct. And um, I think this is important. Clustering, for example, you don't need to define, if you want to identify patterns in the data, you don't need to define what those rules are. I think that's the difference. How does that impact, does that impact on what you can learn from the results of these models? What would be the difference with the classical statistical approach? Well, both of them are, I mean, you are, you are learning from the data, right? I mean, the traditional statistical approach, you have to know what the relationship is between your, I mean, you have to explore. It's an exploratory uh, function, right? You have to learn from the, uh, lo both the methods learn from the data. I mean, uh, but, but the, 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 the reason uh, this, statement is here is because more, I mean, AI algorithms can learn from, um, if you, even if you don't define the rules, it can learn from its data, like it can figure out patterns in the data. But more traditional, what's that? See that? What, what exactly does it, you say it can learn from the data, but what exactly does it learn then? Learn about the historical, patterns, and I think that's where you can make some future predictions. Yeah, so you have pattern recognition, and what, is, what are you doing in classical statistical analysis? Pattern recognition, too. I mean, you're learning from the data. I mean, you're trying to find the association between the variables, between then. But okay, it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult point in classical statistical things. You test hypothesis. So that means that you are the guy or the lady that brings in the model. And that's the difference with especially deep learning, that in deep learning there is no model and it's just associations. And that's a very different way of gathering knowledge, I think. Um, and, and that's very important if you do that in medicine. The advantage is that you can use uh, yeah, missing data. That's not a problem in associations, but that is a problem if there is hypothesis generation, I think. Last question. You say that machine I'm, learning I'm sorry, is most I'm going to interfere if you don't mind. Thank you. But otherwise, we, we run out of time. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Van Biesen. And can we try to go back to Professor Ferris? She yeah, thank you. Oh, perfect. I appreciate, uh, dear candidate, congratulations on such an amazing thesis topic, an amazing amount of work, and your preparation is outstanding. Um, I, I was very 
um, I was very impressed with your work, but I would like to, uh, perhaps I would like to have you discuss a little bit more about the ethical applications and consideration of AI in all fields of medicine. You briefly had a slide in your presentation about things that need to be kept in mind, such as access and equity, literacy, et cetera. But in your dissertation, I would like to draw your attention to page 180. You, you, you offer one paragraph, perhaps I missed it, but I would like for you to have an opportunity now to discuss concepts about health and functional literacy of patients, access to technology, which you briefly touched on. Um, could you comment to expand a little bit as to how one can address those concerns in all fields of artificial intelligence? Highly, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Uh, again, a great question, I think it's a limitation in rolling out AI models to people who are technologically challenged or there is no access to technology. It's definitely a challenge. But there are things that can be done to mitigate some of those challenges. For example, I think the first thing is maybe you work at a local, uh, local uh, level or first they need access to internet. Right, I mean, there are people who may not have access to internet, or they may not know how to access uh, internet. So I think education is important, working with the local NGOs, nonprofit organizations, getting them access to internet is the first thing. Then the second step is to educating them in using some of these technologies. On, a, on, the, on the other side, on the developer side, I think it's important to make sure these technologies are more user-friendly, that the patients are able to understand. It's very simple for them to understand. Then you could also provide training to caregivers or other people around the patient who may be uh, not technologically challenged. I think that's another option of allowing patients to use some of these technologies. I think there are ways of uh, this, it can be mitigated. However, it's definitely a limitation. Thank you for your answer. Um, and thank you for mentioning caregivers. Being a pediatric pathologist, we certainly have to focus on the caregiver, the parent of our patient. I would like to move to, um, I would like to stay in the issue of um, ethical considerations. And could you comment on um, machine training ethics, machine accuracy, some of those important aspects of what we teach the machines or we ask the machines to do and staying on the same um, area. Can you comment about the shared ethics and liability that providers and users have as well as regulators on AI applications in healthcare? Right, thank, thank you for your question, highly esteemed opponent. Again, it's a great question. Um, I think my take on that would be on AI governance. Uh, I think every, every model when implemented, should, there should be some kind of governance layer above the implementation. I mean, not just at the Congress level or you know, not at the government level, but at a company level, there should be AI governance. I think that has to, like you have um, ethics team and a legal team in uh, many companies, you should have an AI governance team. And I think they should be responsible for reviewing all of these um, ethics related to AI model implementation and clinical practice. Thank you for your answer, I appreciate that. And could you lastly, not to run out of time, can you um, expand a little bit about other potential applications of AI in the field of nephrology? Have you had a chance to think about it when you were planning your study? Uh, uh, and the review paper that I have, the first paper, the chapter two of my thesis, lists out a lot of different applications of how AI can be used. Um, we have not discussed, I mean, in my thesis, I don't have anything related to CKD, but, you know, for CKD care, it's, a, it's important, you know, predicting progression of CKD is extremely important. Um, 
you know, same thing with transplant. I think we can identify patients, you know, who's eligible for transplant, who is not. I think uh, those are all some of the other applications. But the review paper that I have was the basis of, you know, understanding what else is out there. Yeah. Thank you. I want to expand on that. Thank you. Thank you for your time and I hard work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Ferris. The opposition will be continued by Professor Linz. He is Professor of Lifestyle Factors in Cardiac Arrhythmia at the University of Copenhagen, but also cardiologist at the University of Maastricht. I apologize because I, shift, I changed over, not to you, but to the next one. But anyway, please um, give your uh, questions and you are also a member of the assessment committee. Yeah, thank you very much. So, dear uh, candidate, congratulations to this very nice uh, well, composition of very nice studies and also very thoughtful analysis and not just to you, but also to the complete uh, team around you, of course, also the family and friends. Um, so, we already talked a little bit about, um, yeah, on the one hand, digital technologies, but on the other hand, also the algorithms. I would like now to discuss a little bit about what to do with those things, actually. Um, there's chapter five. So chapter five was a big group of patients. Um, I think most of them actually were asked to use an app. Mm -hmm. Not all of them downloaded the app, not all of them used them. And yes. then actually you showed those patients who actually used the apps could be split into three different subgroups. One group used it a little bit more, the other a little bit less and the last group actually almost not at all. Right. And what you showed that those who did not use the app went more often back into the hospital compared to those who used right. it more often. I would also then mainly uh, focus here on figure 5.4. Uh, there you can actually see even those who actually used it very frequently, they had a significant drop after one, two, three months. So why do you actually think, why is this? Is just this app not, not entertaining enough? Is it the color, the, the, the out, outline of the, of, of the app? So what, what do you think was particularly in this case the problem? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Um, so that's, a, again, another great question. Uh, I would like to point here that all the users here had access to internet and they all registered. So they were not the ones who were not technologically savvy. So amongst them, there were some who were more engaged and some those who were less engaged, right? I mean, so that's, that's the difference between the three groups. All of them were given equal opportunity to register. They had access to internet and they actually, we know that they logged in and you know, they had access to the remote technology. So, and within them, some were engaged, some were engaged moderately and some were not engaged. So there could be reasons around, you know, they have, to, they have to report these issues every time they do a treatment. Maybe it is, maybe it's not something they would want to, you know, some people are just less engaged. Although they are digitally and uh, more literate, they may be less engaged in taking care of themselves. There is definitely a limitation in this study that those people were less engaged, and I think that's the message I also had in my conclusion, is that it's, it's possible that they were less engaged, and people who are more engaged are more likely to see better clinical outcomes, and I think, but the decrease, the, your, your point about decrease in the uh, use of the application over time, um, I mean, there could be theories such as they may have, you know, they find the application cumbersome to input their data all the time after every treatment. So there is that possibility. But however, you see at month 12, the, f the frequent users were still frequent users. They did not go down a lot. Like they did decrease, but it wasn't, they were still higher than the moderate users and they were still higher than the non-users. So, yes. I mean, they were engaged, but maybe less engaged. Yeah. yeah. So um, you already said well, it was not a randomized trial, of course, and you cannot say that actually the app itself reduced hospitalization and things like this. Um, but do you then actually think, well, using this app, yes, no, can be also something like a risk marker? So, for example, if you look at uh, figure 5.5, 
tell me any other well risk blood marker for example at the moment who can predict as powerful hospitalization within one year compared to using the app yes no yeah th this could be used as a risk marker i think that's a great observation i think uh, it's those who are engaged are having better clinical outcomes yes um yeah but that's i think that's a good comment I think. yeah so so i think the the only thing might of course also be so i think if a patient use, uses the app less often, maybe they also forget medication more often. Maybe they also actually just apply, for example, the hemodialysis uh, kit differently or whatever like this, right? That's a possibility, yes, but we have not looked into it. Yes. Yeah. So this then the, the uh, patient perspective. If we now go to, for example, the physician perspective, um, most of the area under the curves were not 0 0.99, right? Right. They were actually like 0.7 0 .8, maybe, maybe yeah. 0 0.8. You also mentioned uh, something in your propositions. Clinicians using digital technologies and AI should use these applications as a decision support tool, aiding but not replacing their clinical judgment. A lot of us are physicians. So now give me, for example, a algorithm which can has an area under the curve let's say of 0 0.75 mm -hmm. what should i do with this again going back to the picture on my uh, thesis cover it is uh, we i do not anticipate digital technologies or ai algorithm to replace your clinical judgment there is no way that will happen even if it is area under the curve of 0.99 I do not anticipate that it will completely replace a clinical judgment. However, you could use it as a clinical decision support tool. You, you have to use it with your own clinical judgment. It's just another okay. algorithm, yeah. be it AI or traditional model. Yeah. Then actually coming back to the intervention with the nurses, for example, they also had an algorithm. They also needed to decide whether to integrate exactly. the in information of the algorithm yes no so what would be the best randomized trial to actually test something like this so what do you think because there's always the challenge for the physician for the nurse what to do with it and this will be highly variable probably yeah it'll depend from case again case short, by case short answer basis. please yeah it'll de depend on a on an every different case i think it has to uh i mean you have to consider both the AI algorithm and the judgment of the clinician there is, even when you design the randomized control trial. Yes, thank you very much. And I give the word back to the prorector. Thank you, Professor Linz. We, the opposition will be continued by Professor Hemmelder. He is professor of medicine, in particular nephrology at this university, and the secretary of this committee, Professor Hemmelder. Dear candidate, I also want to first congratulate you with the completion of this thesis and also uh, your supervising team. I want to con congratulate with this um, very great results you presented today because I think uh, AI is a new and challenging um, perspective for us as clinicians and we have uh, just now these data already from, from your research so we can have this very good discussion for the future, I think, sure. because there is a lot of work to do yes. when I see uh, the discussion uh, so as it uh, goes by now. Yes. Uh, I want to discuss with you on um, Proposition 2. This maybe one of your paranyms can read it to the public. Proposition 2 says ESKD patients who receive tailored behavioral health interventions from the social workers see improvements in patient reported outcomes such as depressive symptoms, sleep quality, and psychological stress. Thank you. In uh, Maastricht, one of the research subjects of interest is the impact of chronic kidney disease and 
renal failure on patients reported outcomes. So this is a very intriguing uh, proposition for me. Um, and we also mentioned the relation between the patient's report outcomes and clinical outcomes. And it's very interesting to see what AI can add to this, um, what we do already in our practice. So can you explain with your data what is the support for your proposition? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. So, the high-risk patients were, as I mentioned in my presentation, were intervened on by social workers, nurses, and the dietitians. However, we only measured the interventions from the social worker. There were three different things that were measured in um, this particular study. There was a stress score, there was a sleep score, and there was a depression-related questionnaire. And I have examples of that in my thesis in the appendix of that particular chapter, which shows the actual questionnaire of what the patients answered. So what we did was the, they used the model. They, the patients went through a social worker assessment by the social worker, and they went through all these screeners and if the social worker thought they were a good candidate for an intensive program, they went through the intensive program with the social worker. And what we measured was the before and the after results of some of these scores. And the examples of the questionnaires are in the appendix of the chapter. And do you see limitations of your approach in this study? I mean, the only limitation of this approach is we were unable to measure, measure any other interventions that were done, done by the others outside of the social workers. Okay. So that's a big limitation of this. And I see some more limitations if I look to your design, because I think uh, you, what you mentioned, you started with an AI tool to get a high-risk patient selection. Right. That's the first step, I think. Right. And f from that perspective, I read that you have about 14% of, of around 1,100 high-risk patients who are um, getting a behavioral health intervention. So that's a small proportion because at the end it is about 111 selected high-risk patients who, ent who entered your social worker intervention program. Correct. It's a That's small correct. number. Okay? It's a small number. I and agree. it's also a very short term. It's eight weeks program. And do you have information about longer follow up? What happened with these patients after the eight weeks? We do not have that data. No. no, that's a limitation for. And and would you be interested to see what happened in the other patients who don't don't have that intervention by social workers because. Uh, 86 of 86 percent of the patients are also high risk. Correct. But we don't know what happened with them for this kind of outcomes. That's correct. But because we we were unable to measure the social worker an inter intervention on them, yes, it was a limitation in the electronic medical record system. But yes, I think that's a great uh, point, and I think we should be considering that it's definitely a limitation in the study. Yes, because I'm very improved on the results of the intervention because more than 50% of the patients had reported improvement yes. in those eight yes. weeks period. And that's very high. That, that's not what we regularly see in, in studies from patients reported outcomes. And do, do you know why this improvement is such impressive? Is that Well, the social worker intensive program was a definitely a, a very well thought through program by our social workers and they were all very well engaged. I mean, it was an interdisciplinary group of interventions that was, and, I, and I, that's all I can comment at this time and I don't know beyond that, you know, if there were other interventions that were done. Okay, yeah. so that's my last remark on, on this issue because I think, and you already described it, that also the measurement of the interventions by the social workers was not uh, clearly uh, defined in your in your study, uh, you 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 you, num you um, accounted for the number of notes social yes, workers correct. marked in the electronic records. So I think th that has to be uh, improved to to make a proposition you did uh, for proposition two to re to re precise the proposition that is not for 
is key, it states kidney disease patients who get a program, but it's for high selected uh, risk patients who have entered this program. Uh, and I, I'm very interested what happens in future studies if we do it in an other uh, design, if you will get the same re impressive results and maybe we can work on it together in absolutely, the future. Absolutely. Okay, so considering the time, I will give the, uh, I thank you for your answers and I give the word back to the pro-rector. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hemmelder. The opposition will be continued by Professor Kotanka. Ko, sorry. Um, he is adjunct professor of nephrology at the Incan School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York, United States. Yeah. Thank you, uh, dear candidate. First, really congratulate you uh, on this work. I mean, you stepped out of the ivory tower of uh, data analytics and really moved into clinical applications. And I, I think this is such a new field that really requires, where, where research of the kind you conduct is quite uh, important to inform future directions of, um, of the field. Now, I'm wondering, uh, usually uh, you would use multiple AI tools, but also classical statistical tools to analyze a specific problem to make prediction models. Now, how do you actually decide uh, what kind of model to eventually apply? I'm thinking about a situation where you would want to submit a winner and I don't know how you decide about that, say to a regulatory agency, to the FDA, to make a determination is the decision support system, is a medical device and, so, and the like. How would you, what, what uh, considerations enter your decision? Which model do you use at the end of the day mm -hmm. in a patient? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. I think when you decide what model is good, I think you have to look at a number of different metrics. It's not just the AUC. You have to look at precision, you have to record, look at recall, you have to look at the AUPCR, the precision recall curve, area under the precision recall curve. I think it's a combination of several different metrics that one should look at before you make a decision. Uh, and it again depends on what your what the underlying data is. You have to have a thorough understanding of what gets into the model. Like what are you building? What is the training data made up of? I think that's an important consideration. You have to understand your training data. You have to understand these metrics. And you can, we can then make a decision on, you know, based on these performance metrics, what is the right model? Now in terms of your, to your question about for regulatory, uh, needs if you want to submit the model somewhere, I think, again, training data becomes important. If there is a need to provide that training data along with the model is an important factor to consider. I mean, is it a black box model that you're just submitting? I mean, you have to understand what, what, what you're feeding into the model and what comes out of the model and what the performance metrics are. I think that would be my short answer to your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering, for example, if, um, if aspects like computational costs play a role, if aspects such as um, transparency of the model would play a role, everything else being equal, if, um, if, the, the, if uh, you know, paucity of data, if, the, um, if stability of data, if this would play a role too, especially when considering of submitting a model to, to regulatory agencies. Absolutely, I think all of those factors are important. Um, the cost of developing the model, the cost, the computational cost, as you mentioned, and uh, the cost of interventions that we were just discussing here a while back. Um, I think that's all important. Those are all important considerations. Um, somewhat related to this question is, um, I mean, the evaluation of a model. Um, in many models, I evaluate it based on historic data. Um, I, I would want to get your thoughts around prospective evaluation of models. And it was asked in the same direction by, from a slightly different angle by some of my colleagues here already. But I, I'm wondering, um, 
what kind of, in an ideal world, uh, what kind of uh, evaluation, prospective evaluation, would you want to see? I mean, the best approach is to perform a randomized control trial. Like you have to randomize your group of patients where you're applying the model on and uh, the other group of patients where you don't have the model applied on. And I think we have not done that in any of my studies. These are mostly all retrospective studies. Uh, I think you have to come up with a design there where you know the model and the interventions are thoughtfully applied to the control group, sorry, the randomized group, and the and it's not applied on the other. I mean, just like any other drug trial, I think it is no different than performing it on any other, testing any other drug. Um, do you see any activities in that direction? More specifically, are you aware of uh, anyone having done that in the field in nephrolo of nephrology with AI-based models? No, this is fairly novel. At least in my opinion, I have not come across anything that has uh, used randomized control trial in the field. Okay, I'm wondering if, I mean, you are, you are, you are working for a very large dialysis provider. If, for example, uh, cluster randomized trials could be relevant here, so whether the unit of randomization are dialysis facilities uh, rather than individual patients. Uh, do you have any thoughts in that? Yeah, direction? and I think using AI to f design these randomized trials is a great idea. I think you can use AI techniques to identify uh, cohorts of patients where these models and interventions can be applied. You may briefly answer the question, but very briefly. Yes, I think it's, a, it's possible we could use AI methods to uh, create these, design these randomized control trials in you know, and then apply AI on a certain set of group and not have the, that be applied to the other. So AI can be used to design some of these trials. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Kotanko. Shital Chaduri, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The, the Greek committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. And I request you and your company to await the results of our deliberation in this room. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. Tied. 
Long road, I don't waste no time. Break rules because fate decides. With the team and we chase the light. I make a move, fall down, shake it off. I hate to lose bad branch, break it off. No room for negativity, praise and love. Prepare for deep part because we're taking off. Get the mileage,
Chital Chardouri, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to de uh, grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Coleman is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. And I invite uh, your supervisor now to take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful, honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? I promise. By the authority vested in us by law, and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Chital Chaudhuri, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university. Thank you. Well, Sheetal, congratulations. This is so exciting. I know I said earlier today to process the moment, so I hope you've been processing the moment continuously. This is really, I know this took a long way to get here, and I really want to congratulate you. I also want to thank the corona, of course. I want to thank the opponents. I want to thank the audience and our wonderful colleagues from Ukraine. I want to thank your family. I see you let your husband sit downstairs now, <laughs> closer to the audience. That's very nice. Um, and I specifically want to thank Dr. Kuman for the tremendous support in making all of this happen. And of course, Dr. Larkin, who I know has spent a lot of time with you uh, to make sure to guide you through this whole process. Um, I want to also reassure everybody that what I'm about to say was not written by Chad GPT. Uh, I can tell you that it would have been much better, it would have been much faster, much, you know, much more eloquent than what I'm about to say, but nonetheless, I wanted to just make sure everybody knows this. So I wanted to actually start off and talk about, I, I was thinking about you and how you got to this point, and I, I was reminded again and again of how important random events are in our lives, and how sometimes you meet a random person on the street who becomes your partner, or sometimes you... Uh, write a thought on a napkin in a restaurant that eventually becomes something really wonderful. Mondo Initiative, Peter, certainly was one of those uh, types of efforts. And I think actually how you and I have met was also a fairly random event. So for most of you do not know this, but we do work for the same company actually. And um, about 10 years ago, we were working for the same organization. I didn't know who Sheetal was. I was invited to a meeting where Sheetal was there and, um, you know, there was a person working in a different department. I didn't know who she was. Uh, but what was interesting, and what I still remember to this date, there was another person in that room, who of course she tell you know, who actually introduced us to data and analytics and to our various data assets um, in the organization about 10 years prior to that. So this is going back about 20 years ago. And, and actually, I think it was that that inspired us at some point to even help us form the Mondo Initiative and so on. And so this random event from about 10 years ago, I think has now culminated in this. 
Um, and so I think it's a, um, I, I was once again reminded of how important it is. And I think your journey into kidney disease and really being able to bridge the, the IT and technical aspects together with clinical care and how to translate the technical stuff into what is actually useful for doctors, clinicians, I think as was mentioned, there's a number of doctors here in the room. And I think um, I would certainly say that you've approached your thesis the same way as you approach your family and your work and everything else um, with a lot of dedication, with a lot of commitment, uh, also being extremely calm and strategic about things. Um, uh, Sheetal is probably one of the calmest um, uh, thinkers that I know. Uh, for those of you who do not know this, she is a chess player. So I think this, you know, this kind of makes sense why this actually happened. Uh, and then I also thought, why is it that Sheetal is so interested in always continuing her education? And actually, I was reading your acknowledgement and about your father, uh, that he was a teacher that I think really made me understand um, of why not only she has a PhD now, for those of you who have m missed the point, she actually has two master's degrees already. So I told her that she'll need a little extra space after her name to, uh, as, as she moves forward in her, uh, uh, putting her name on different, uh, on different books and so on. She's also a bit of a perfectionist, so I think a lot was said about the quality of your, th of your presentation. And I think, again, for those of you who don't know this, I think she's, uh, She's practiced her presentation, I don't know how many hundreds of times, to be honest with you. Uh, and I think in conclusion, I, I also was very fortunate to attend a number of Sheetal's dinners. Uh, Sheetal hosts some amazing dinners, and she's a wonderful, wonderful cook. And I really thought to, me, to myself that I think she, the way she approached her thesis is the same way she hosts her dinners. You know, usually um, they all require a lot of, they both require a lot of work. Uh, they are usually ample in variety and diversity. Uh, they are very thought through, and at the end of the day, they're very, very satisfying, just like a thesis. So on this note, again, I want to congratulate not just you, of course, but I want to congratulate your family, who I, uh, um, who I see in the first row right now. And, and most importantly, I want to say congratulations, Dr. Sheetal Chowdhury. Congratulations. Thank you. Dear Dr. Chaudhuri, also on behalf of the Maastricht University, I congratulate you with the degree that you have acquired. The Maastricht University is, of course, very honored to have another laureate from outside of this university, and your name will be attached to this university forever. So thank you for that. Um, congratulations on this very nice thesis, which was, I think, very timely. I mean, we now overwhelmed with the amount of artificial intelligence that is going at this, and uh, everybody's worried, should we worry about it, uh, will they take over? But you show that this, it will be an important part of the work of us as doctors in the, in the near future, or already now. So that, that's very good, and, and your career is amazing. You started in India, you were, went to the United States, now you do your thesis here in Maastricht. Yes. So very well done, and of course, congratulations to your family, your children, I think yeah. your brother and sister, if I'm correct. Yes, my brother. Um, yeah. Maybe online also. So when online, congratulations there as well. Oh. Um, and also that we will have a nice drink afterwards. So thank you for that. That will be in the um, rafter. Um, so we will guide, will be guided there. Um, just for a practical note, uh, the audience can go already to that uh, reception. We will stay here because we will make a picture with our online guests. And of course, a big thank you to all uh, people in these, this committee, from, in particular from outside of uh, Maastricht, um, from all over the world. So thank you for that. So we will stay here. The audience is free to go to the uh, rafter and start with a drink. And we will make some pictures with the online guests and then later on the stairs as well. And now I hereby close this academic session. Yeah. <laughs>